So welcome to the gathering room. And we have a special, special guest today. This is Emma Nadler or Nadler? Nadler. Emma Nadler. Okay, so Emma Nadler, author of The Unlikely Village of Eden, which is out right now. You can go get it um, at Amazon or place any place where fine books are sold. So welcome, Emma. It's so good to have you. Thank you so, so much for having me. I'm really, really glad to be here with you and kind of used to life in Plan B. So here we are on Instagram, not Facebook, which I think really kind of sums up what my book is about, which is the life that does not go to plan. So we just pivot as we do. Um, my phone popped out of its holder. That's where I went. And here I am. We're just going to do the here best we, we can here imp imperfectly together. I love that the way you, you frame it up, that it's about when life doesn't go to plan because it really never does. But um, there are certain things that mess up our life plans more than others. And you had an absolute doozy, um, a wonderful, blessed event that turned your plans upside down. So eight years ago, you want to give the folks a bit of a description of what happened? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I had my second child and, and we, the plan was she was healthy. We did all the testing prenatally, um, and, and then things, she just, she had some feeding challenges. Things just didn't quite seem, it didn't quite seem that she was getting what she needed, developing typically. Mm -hmm. And we did some genetic testing just in case, like just, let's just see, not expecting anything big. And then um, got the news that my daughter Eden was born with a extremely rare significant genetic deletion, which means that she's missing a good amount of DNA. And, um, and, and so that, and it's a diagnosis, it's so rare, there wasn't, there was, there's no known understanding of how that would unfold, only that it would be a, a really significant impact in her life, um, with a lot of different medical challenges developmentally. Um, and so we just, so we were flung into uncertainty. Yeah. Um, and which I think, you know, many people can relate to perhaps not in this specific way, yeah. since my daughter has such a rare condition, but I think this, this feeling that, you know, there was a plan that you have for your life and you think, yep, it's going to be this way. This is how it's going to be. And then there's at least one major deviation, if not a series of many yeah. that we often experience. Um, in, in life. And so this was ours, this is mine. Um, and then that altered the shape of my life forever yeah. in so many ways. Yeah. And it's so interesting because you are also a psychotherapist. So you are in a unique position to sort of comment on your own process. And isn't it always true that people seek out psychotherapy therapy because their lives are not going to plan. So do you have a, a thing you say, like, as you said, we were talking before we went live. I have a son with Down syndrome, but it's so much more cut and dried, predictable. Like there's a huge range of behaviors and disabilities and abilities and different abilities with Down syndrome. But what you're dealing with had no name, had no prognosis, had nobody else to go talk to. As a psychotherapist, when somebody comes in and says, my life's turned upside down, do you, do you have like a process that you learned from dealing with this? Okay, here's how you go into a totally uncertain future. Hmm. What do you tell people? Yeah, 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 that's such a great question. And I, and we're all grappling with uncertainty. Like no matter who you are, being alive is uncertain. So I think part of it is accepting and not fighting that we all live with uncertainty. And that's, that's a part of the human experience. And we're also wired to not want that uncertainty. Yeah. You know, we want to know, and I think evolutionarily, like when the saber tooth tigers come in through the village, like we, we want to know when they're coming. Like we evolutionarily, we want to have a plan of like what's going to happen and when. Yeah. And yeah. that really, I think, so it hits on a core part for a lot of people wanting to know. Mm -hmm. um, so I think part of it is accepting, it's like that radical acceptance 
piece. Yeah. Um, like I'm, I'm a real big fan of radical acceptance. And when I say really big fan, I mean, I have to return to it again and again, how personally. How do you do that? What yeah. do you have? A, how yeah. do you, like you just, she just got out of the hospital again on Wednesday, you were telling me. Mm -hmm. So that's another week that didn't go or month or whatever. Like there are so many days when you get your feet taken out from under you. And all of us have that in little ways, but in your life, it's major. Yeah. So what, yeah. when it happens again, you said you have to go back to it and go back to it. How, how does that look for you? Like I'm, I'm very how-to oriented. Yeah. And I love that. Well, I think part of how it looks is calling in my people. So mm. part of how it looks, and, and I really think like in my memoir, what I share is, I think we can get through nearly anything if we are not alone. Yeah. yeah. So the unlikely village of Eden. So if we are not alone, we can generally do it. And so I'm really curious whenever I'm going through something or whenever something becomes more acute yeah. with my daughter or anything else, it's like, how can I not be alone in this? How hmm. can I reach out, ask for help? put it out there. Um, so I, I've gotten, I've gotten good at that, that part of it. And, and I didn't start there. And that's a lot of what the book is yeah. about is, yeah. is starting out in this place of maybe wanting or hoping people would know what I needed or yeah. um, trying not to have those needs at all, which I think yeah. really reflects cultural norms and motherhood. Yeah. Like, don't have needs, just sacrifice yourself. Yeah. Right. And and so now I'm like, I mean, I, I, I take better care of myself and, and I also know how to, and I do ask for help. And that doesn't mean it's, it's great. You know, like, I mean, yeah, it was really hard in the hospital. And um, there was, there were times where I, I really, you know, I, I really felt um, the intensity of what my kid has to go through, you know, cause she does have to experience some suffering. And as much as I want to take that away, I, sometimes I can't. And I, and I'm still doing everything I can for her to advocate for her. Um, but, but it's not up to me. And so that's a lot to grapple with for any of us, right. Who love people who struggle, you know, how do you let go? How do you be present with your daughter and love her and not be overwhelmed by that suffering? I think that's a big question for the people who come mm -hmm. to this with me. They're very empathetic. And, and how do you be with people and help them and heal them? And you're a healer. Yeah. And not be overwhelmed by their pain, especially when it's your child. And the culture does basically tell you you're supposed to be molded to them and fix everything. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes I am overwhelmed. And mm. then when I'm overwhelmed, I just notice that I'm overwhelmed. And then I try to deal with that. So I think there were times where I felt that, right? And I do feel mm. that. And then, and then I try to deal with what is, I guess. Um, like, mm. I don't feel like I have any... I wish I had like some magic answer about, you know, how not to react when your child is suffering. But I think that, um, but I think that what I, what I do is, I mean, I, I try to feel it and deal with it, mm -hmm. you know, feel and deal with what she needs and then get the support that I need. Um, and I, and I, and I have people in my corner and I've kept people in my corner, the people who can really get it. That's yeah, who I'm yeah. interested in connecting with. Yeah. So you talk in the book about how some friends, I mean, you don't say anything negative about anyone, but it's clear that some people were up for this and some people weren't, yeah. you know, and some of them were like, uh, really caught the spirit of there's something wonderful and special about this child. And I want to be there in her life. And, and it's amazing that you, you know, this retired business CEO, uh, an older, gen a middle-aged man is like, no, Eden is my best friend and I'm going to be there with her. Yeah. And uh, that's beautiful. And then there are other people that you let go of and, and what's left is the village. Do you ever think that um, well, I, what, if Eden hadn't been different or if you never had her, what would your village look like then? And would it be the kind of, would it be uh, it's apples and oranges, but do you look around and think, thank God for this village? I would, I never would have known this if, mm -hmm. if I hadn't gone through this suffering. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think about that and, and, and I, I mean, I think I've been really fortunate to meet 
some of some incredible people through through my daughter through um the circles and the people that she has drawn into her life and also people i've reached out to and they've reached out to us and you know however relationships happen which is definitely a two-way street yeah 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 um so yeah i mean we've we've been really i think in, in some ways it's luck and in some ways it's there's a lot of factors yeah. that go into relationships yeah. sometimes it's pure chance uh, and i do marvel and part of my book is around that magic of pure chance of the people that we can meet in our yeah. lives and how yeah. we really never know who's going to change our lives and i think mm -hmm. that's um incredible like just to to consider we don't mm -hmm. know like we could i could meet someone tomorrow you know and then that yeah. person becomes right and um so yeah i think there's there's that part has been really amazing um to have to have that those connections and, and and what is your way of relating to eden herself because against like i was really stunned um that she learned to walk and talk and tell jokes and i mean she's really when a patch of dna is missing mm -hmm. that's that big i wow it's amazing how much she can do yeah given that the extremity of that that issue or what i would think of it but um how do you relate to her? Because like my relationship with Adam is very different uh, from what it would be if he didn't have Down syndrome, obviously. And there's, I had to go to a frequency. Okay, now I'm getting woo woo, but that y'all know I'm woo woo. Yeah. I had to find another frequency. He wasn't verbal um, or he still isn't really that verbal as an adult, mm. but he also has a very, strong frequency that when I can reach it allows me to connect with him Ugh, it is very woo woo like he knows when I'm upset he like throughout his life we've had a, a connection that is more psychic than just material has I'm not saying that that has to happen to you but do you have a different way of relating to her that you had to develop as she grew mm -hmm. well a lot of how we relate is through pop music because oh, cool. she is a serious pop fan and knows so much about music. And my husband's a musician. So it's, it's, been, it's been fun for us um, in, in so many ways. And if you're going to have, I mean, she just has this like deep love of like all the divas and uh, all this like uh, and things i wasn't necessarily like super into before before her but she um we listened to songs and that's a lot of how she learned to read was the lyrics wow. Wow. Um, reading lyrics of songs and she has incredible pitch and loves to sing huh. and so we we listen to music and and even when she was just in the hospital like we bumped Beyonce like all through the floors of the hospital like we would go around in her wheelchair and uh, we would play Beyonce and all the staff would laugh because and and like kind of cheer us on and and Beyonce was happened to be in town in Minneapolis at the same time and oh, so we cool. would we would say like you know no one at the hospital was at the concert but like come hang out with us you know because we were at the hospital um so I don't know but she's fun I mean she's just mm. she's very fun and joyful uh, and uh, um and that music piece is an amazing way to connect that's that's incredible and and i, I think that's what the arts are for really to get past the usual cultural ways of connecting we've been getting questions i'm going to read some of them to you okay okay someone says and this is a big one i wonder it myself how do you deal with the overwhelm because you've got your career, you've got a child with continuing needs, you've got this whole village to connect with. That's actually a lot of connecting work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, how do you deal with overwhelm? Um, I think that having a spiritual connection has been helpful to me. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time in nature and we moved out away from the city when mm. when Eden had the most medical needs, we decided to leave Minneapolis and come farther out and be around the woods. And yeah. uh, my neighbor comes and grows flowers with mm. me and I make bouquets. And um, so I think that piece is really helpful to me. Um, I have, you know, I'm Jewish. That happens to be helpful to me. I think 
you don't need to have any one religion or belief set. I think it's just great to have some kind of connection with right. any kind of spiritual life. And that can look so many ways. Mm. There's never one right way for that. Um, but that's that community has been helpful to me. Um, so, and I think the people that I know and reaching out and, and being real about those things, those are some of the things that, that helped me to manage it. Beautiful. Huh. Yeah, it's, it's a lot, but it, you certainly, I mean, read the book folks. You want to get this book to find it because you're so honest in it about, you know, several times you just are like, I can't do this anymore. And yet you always do it. <laughs> that, that I, I, like four or five times you talk about it, it just got to a point where you couldn't do it. And you would tell people you couldn't do it. And yet you always, you never checked out completely. You were always able to show up by kind of, I loved your resourcefulness and the way you kind of were always like a fisherman throwing out line after line and going, what kind of thing can I connect to that will help me and help her? And you just kept, and, and you, your family relationships, you have an older son, your relationship with your husband, you're really, really honest about all this stuff and the way you just kind of tried everything until you found things that worked is really inspiring. And it really helps me think, yeah, that's what I will do the next time things go, don't go to plan. Um, we've got another question here. How do you calm down, calm yourself down when everything is so uncertain? This person says, I'm in my early 20s and terrified of the future because anything can happen. And, and we do, young people have higher rates of anxiety than ever before in history. Yeah. So the world isn't going to plan, right? Right. So here's a 20 year old saying, anything can happen, please help me hmm. deal with that fact. Yeah. Well, I, another thing that is connected here is, I mean, I like to say every good therapist needs a good therapist. Amen. And I think every person who's really grappling with something, I think if you can to connect with a therapist, um, that was really helpful yeah. for me. And my therapist was, I, I was getting a lot of pity. Mm -hmm. I was getting a lot mm -hmm. of, oh my God, I, how do you do this? I can't imagine. And, and all well-intentioned, but, um, but I didn't, I, I felt like this distancing when people would say things yeah. like that. And, okay. and my therapist said, I think you can have a good life. Mm -hmm. um, he just said, mm -hmm. I, I think you can. And I think Eden can too. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then I really wanted to fight for it because I felt like there was someone that believed that for me. Mm -hmm. And that's something I really try to pass along. Um, because I think most of the time we can find a way to have a good life. Yeah, um, and, and e with regardless of of the circumstances, and yeah. so um, I'm really interested in that, you know. And and in this setting, of course, we're not in. This is not therapy. This is just you know our conversation. Yeah. But um, but when I do work with clients in a therapy role, um, I am really interested in in, in exploring that with them. Like yeah. just because I believe that for people that you can yeah. still have a good life, and and like what would that look like for you? And so, I mean, I think part of it is like focusing on that too, holding that with the pain yeah. and the uncertainty. Yeah. It's, it's all there, um, but we can't get away from uncertainty. Yeah. So like, so that's, I mean, I, you know, I, th I think there's so much we could talk about with this. We could talk about this all day. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's that saying, I can't remember who said this, someone in the sixties, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Mm -hmm. and, and no two waves are ever alike and they just keep coming and coming and coming i was only 25 when adam was born so i hadn't really gone through a ton of life crises yet but i remember thinking i was always trying to reframe things in a positive way after getting therapy at 18 i was like maybe i do want to live but i i'm gonna have to reframe everything and um then when adam was diagnosed i was actually told you can't reframe this one you can't have a good life that's not going to happen for you either put this kid in an institution or you will not have a happy life you will never stop grieving you will never feel whole and they showed me evidence studies and i was like screw that yeah. <laughs> i was like no no okay how far do i have to go to reframe my life to make this okay to make and and one of the things that we both have also is 
as caregivers, and I've been very, very, very blessed as well, but I've never just walked out the door to go on a trip without arranging childcare mm -hmm. for the last, since what, since 1988. Like that's a long time to not be able to leave without arranging some kind of care. Um, that, that was staring me in the face from, from a very young age. And what I had to do was go completely outside of culture, entirely outside of culture. And I love that you moved to the wilderness or closer to the wilderness when Eden was most, because she was so in need, you'd think being by the big hospitals would be great, but that's when you moved to nature instead. Yeah. yeah. And, and Martha, I, I read Expecting Adam many years ago and then reread it um, once oh. we had Eden and once I got her diagnosis. And you have been such a pioneer ah. in challenging, challenging the ableist cultural norms and really <laughs> pushing that piece. And I, I just think like it resonated so much with me about this idea of perfectionism and yeah you know, able, you know, kids, even, even to, to call someone healthy or not healthy and to judge that right. has, has some judgment, um, about one is better and one is worse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, um, just the way that you talked about Adam uh -huh. and the way that you opened, like, let him in, it, it really, it was really helpful for me personally. Oh, so I well, wanted to share that with you. It's yeah. not an interview about yeah. me. It's yeah, an interview but, about I mean, Emma but it's notable. Her. I know. But it is it is notable um, that that affected. And that's kind of, you know, I, I want to keep going with that. Keep going with the mm. challenging ableism. Because I started this adventure with my daughter having um, some, you know, sort of grappling with my yeah. own ableist thoughts or yeah you know and and really wanted to challenge those through the book and in my own life about, you really do yeah i hope so because i think some of those cultural norms especially around perfection and um and you know atypical and having a, a child that's different yeah. is less than i mean we, we've got to keep going on that because yeah. the work is not done like we still live in a culture where people send out the baby's notes and they say mom and baby are healthy and and healthy is great but it's also it, it it's complicated you know it's complicated what if they sent out a thing that said mom and baby will have difficult lives and then die that would be just <laughs> as true it doesn't matter how healthy you are like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and right and it, and i get how like i want my kid it's so complex because part of what eden has struggled with is is these medical challenges yeah. And, and it's, and it has been hard, you know, so I don't want to say, like, let's try to be, you know, go for unhealthy, because it's, it's just complex. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let, uh, Elizabeth has a question. Um, how are you able, and this is really pertains to what we were saying about culture. I think that's at the heart of this. How were you able to balance the needs of your child, your career, and your own personal needs? And we've been talking about it. Um, so you've gone at it in many ways. But for me, what the book says is mm -hmm. go outside all expectation, you know, mm. go into the yeah. country beyond expectation and see what you can find there. I love that. So, and you, I, you did, I love you did that. an incredible job. Just incredible. I, I, and I, I mean, I love that. And, and it's still, I think because we're never outside of culture, I feel like I'm constantly sort of trying to live creatively and challenge some of those norms and then mm -hmm. um even in like motherhood just um you know trying not to only be good mm -hmm. like I, that's such a cultural yeah. norm that I think we inherit um like what would it be like to to be something beyond that you know yeah um yeah, so I mean, I don't know. I think the, the like people who are talking about balance is a myth. I think that's true. Yeah. Um, I, I don't. I'm not in balance, but I, but I have work that I love and people that I love, mm. and it is really imperfect. Like I'm not just like, it's imperfect, and yeah. um, yeah, and that's all I can really say about that. Maybe that balance is a myth, and that we're we just do the best that we can with it. Yeah. So 
somebody else asks, and you've, you've addressed this too, uh, with your, your religious and spiritual community. She says, is spiritual help something you go to feel a need for? And here's what I will say um, as a sociologist, or I was once a sociologist, there is, a, you just said we're always in culture, but there is a time when we're not. And that is a, an experience when we're away from others and in connection with what they call the numinous, like some source of meaning that we derive when we are by ourselves and often in nature. And it actually is not cultural, but it's the spark of all new cultures. So somebody who's had that experience comes back to the village in the hypothetical traditional setting and says, I have had a connection with spirit, essentially, with something, with the great spirit, whatever that is. Yeah. And from that, a different culture begins to form. That is the seed of all cultures. And when I read this, I thought, mm -hmm. the unlikely village of Eden is a new culture. It's a culture where normalcy is not defined by having the same genes. Normalcy is not defined by having, being able to run off and have a vacation without taking care of your kids. Normalcy is defined by love, as you just said, um, by the moment, by staying balanced on the wave that's moving now. And it actually is a great model for a culture for anyone moving forward. What Natalia said about, I'm 20 and terrified. You need the same kind of culture that Emma created around Eden. And I just love the way that culture is going abroad now because words are, not, are the conveyors of culture. And this book has within it the recipe, in a way, for do, finding that connection with the numinous because of the calamity, what appears to be the calamity. And then because of that, learning to balance and play you know, you talk about the fun and the joy. Yes. And when your village is there together and she's the center of it, Eden's the center of it, everybody's the center of it, right? Nobody's the center and everybody's the center. Yeah. But it's based on joy, love, and unconditional acceptance. And who doesn't want that? Right. Like, we all desperately need that right now. Yes. Yeah, we do all desperately need that. And I think that's why this book is resonating with people because we we live in a, it, we're isolated. And I think more so after the pandemic mm. Um, mm -hmm. than yeah. perhaps ever before. And we're all longing to, to find connection, to, to have webs of helping and being helped, to be in mutual reciprocal relationships where we're mm -hmm. taking care of each other. Yeah. Um, not just one way, but really back and forth and all around and and so, yeah, I mean, I think I am really interested in like, how could we make the world more, how could we be more connected here? How could we be less alone? Yeah. What can we do to reach out to each other along? Because everybody, even if you don't have a kid, you know, with, with a serious medical challenge, you know, if if you just have a kid or multiple kids or whatever, and you're parenting in this world right now, yeah. or grandparenting yeah. or aunting or whatever or you're doing, living. exactly, or living, or you have a dog, I don't care. It's hard. <laughs> okay. It's hard. And, and there's a lot every day that we all struggle with. It, yeah. It's, it's a universal and we need each other. And so, yeah, I think if you're 20 years old, who can you bring in? Yeah. How can you create regular time of connection? Maybe you can start when I became, when I became a mother, I started a group for mothers because I didn't know enough moms and I wanted to have friends who had babies, but you certainly don't need to be a parent to create something, yeah. make, you know, make a book club, make a discussion group, make a neighborhood, um, you know, fire, bonfire I don't know <laughs> be safe but um but I just think we can we have a lot of power in what we can create together is what yeah. I'm trying to say at any stage of life it, it, it doesn't need to be one stage yes and if you want to find that power in the worst thing that ever happened to you 
read this book and then bring up the times in your life when things do not go to plan and watch the way Emma sort of sifts through the things that didn't work and then goes to the things that do work and the way she's building community around her. It's a beautiful sort of, it's a great story, a great guidebook to all of us living in an uncertain time. And I hope you all run and buy it. Okay, thank you so much, Emma. Thank you, everyone. Sorry for the switch over of formats, but that's what we yeah. do yes. when we're dealing with Emma Nadler. <laughs> she handles things, right? Go find out how. Yes, thank you. it's thank very you. on brand. Thank you so, so much for having me, Martha. Give Emma a big, I, sorry, give Eden a big, big hug. I will. I absolutely okay. will. This has been such a joy with you today. Thank and you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See you all soon. Bye. Bye.